I'm a senior director of market development for PCA. Okay. And uh, PCA is not too far away. PCA is the Portland Cement Association. And about four years ago, five years ago, Don gave us a very good economic presentation. And I can tell you, he was right on target. It wasn't always good news, but he was right, he was right on target. So I uh, appreciate you being here today sure, and making that turn over, Don. Sure. All right, so I'm with the Portland Cement Association. What I'll talk about is um, some economic trends. This is information that was put together by our market intelligence staff. Our senior economist is Ed Sullivan. Who he, he took a more aggressive approach when the downturn hit. We were very active in the National Association of Home Builders. They were not happy with us when Ed was forecasting the decline that happened has been cautiously optimistic as, as things have recovered and has, has trended a little, a little below what the overall consensus has been and that, that has proven out too. The, mark, the single family market in particular hasn't come back quite as quickly as, as a lot of folks had assumed. For those of you who are not familiar with our organization, Portland Cement Association, PCA for short, we're the trade association for America's cement producers. We're headquartered across the street, I could have walked over. We're celebrating 100 years of supporting our industry. Our campus uh, over here in Skokie, which also includes Construction Technology Group, which is the for-profit research subsidiary of PCA. We also have a Washington, D.C. office that does uh, advocacy on behalf of uh, cement and the concrete industry. And we have 24 member companies that manufacture cement. To make that distinction between cement and concrete, <coughs> cement is the constituent, the glue essentially, that gets mixed with water, air, and coarse and fine aggregates, large and small stones, to create concrete. So there is a difference. And so our members are making the cement that gets incorporated in the concrete. So my job as Senior Director of Market Development is to promote the use of concrete in all types of applications. From the single family residential market, commercial markets, paving, uh, concrete roof tiles as an example of the type of products that incorporate um, our members' products. We continue an active role in industry advocacy uh, we support increased infrastructure investment, roads, support of, of the national highway bills and efforts, and the job creation that we see coming out of that. Uh, we continue to work with the Environmental Protection Agency on fair and reasonable emissions because the cement manufacturing process is a very uh, energy intensive process. And so there are emissions, and our industry has worked hard to reduce its emissions component by over 20% in the last 20 years. We also promote and are actively engaged in promotion of high-performance buildings, both from an energy perspective as well as a resilience perspective. So the value of concrete-based products to uh, from an impact resistance perspective, from a wind resistance perspective, um, in addition to the energy efficiency benefits that, that can be gained from the use of, of concrete systems. We co-sponsored the Concrete Sustainability Hub at MIT with the National ready Mix Concrete Association, their education foundation. The Concrete Sustainability Hub is engaged in research that uh, is designed to demonstrate the sustainable value of concrete products and systems across paving markets and across buildings, um, taking a more long-term approach to construction. Uh, we have an initiative called Think Harder Concrete, which a major thrust for our organization with the economic downturn on the building side, focused on concrete roads and highways, demonstrating concrete is the lowest cost material compared to asphalt, and I'll touch on that a little more as I get into the economic information as well as being the most durable and sustainable material for highway construction. We also have award programs where we look at uh, trying to recognize excellence in cement manufacturing in the construction market and in sustainability. So um, on the manufacturing side, there are energy and environmental awards that recognize efforts by our members to reduce the, the uh, environmental footprint of the manufacturing of cement 
Uh, we have a Concrete Bridge Awards program, pretty much self-explanatory. We have safety awards, again, for the manufacturing side of our products, as well as something new, which we started last year, which is the Resilience Leadership Awards, which speaks to recognizing projects that are um, particularly successful from a resilience perspective and demonstrating the value of concrete for uh, more durable, more disaster resistant construction. From an overall consumption perspective, Portland cement consumption, ready mixed concrete obviously the largest percentage use of our materials, but concrete roof tile commands about 1%, and so that's why for a long time now we've been have worked alongside the Tile Roofing Institute. So let's talk about economic trends. <clears throat> From a total cement consumption perspective, our industry lost 66% during the downturn. As of 2015, as of last year, we've recovered about 39% of that lost power. A lot of economists are worried about the federal debt. Now at a level, highest level, in the post-World War II era. Our economic group is not concerned about the national debt. Instead, because our economy is driven by consumer spending, they look at things like household debt as a share of gross domestic product. And they have seen that steadily decline as a percentage of GDP. So they see that as a healthy sign. Not only is the overall household debt declining, but the cost of that debt to each household is also uh, declining because interest rates have remained so low. So there's more disposable income out there uh, in the marketplace. Another positive sign is the unemployment rate has been declining, but the underemployment rate is also <coughs> The gap between the official rate and the underemployment rate, the underemployment rate being the rate that moves discouraged workers, so that's really a more accurate uh, picture of the overall economic or the unemployment rate in the United States. And the gap between the two has been narrowing back to historic levels, so it's coming back. And that that is a predictor of overall health of the economy as well. So that's a good sign. So recent trends. I've talked about the good signs in the consumer and the employment side. This is one that our economic department is watching very closely. Over the past six months, the Dodge contract awards uh, numbers have taken a real downturn, 26% decline. It's the largest decline since December of 2008. It's something that our economic folks are watching, but at the same time, they're saying something's not making sense because in past cycles, when the Dodge contract awards number, you, you would see the private sector go down first because they're, the private sector is more risk adverse. So you'd see the, the private sector react more quickly if there were some fundamental issues driving this decline in contract reward. And then the public sector would follow behind. That's not happening. This time, both are going down at the same time. And what that's suggesting to our economic folks is that there's something that may not be accurate about these numbers. So from a regional perspective, there's some factors that are gonna affect the, the overall recovery across the country. States that have 10% or greater manufacturing share of total employment, including Illinois, in the Midwest, because of the downturn in China and the strong dollar, you're going to see some impact in terms of overall manufacturing strength in these states. Similarly, from an agricultural perspective, the strong dollar, the weakness in China, also affects exports of agricultural products overseas, just like in manufacturing. Those are important trends that are going to affect overall continued economic growth. And then there are six states that are impacted by the downturn in oil prices. But the combined mix 
you see the Midwest being particularly affected by the reduction in exports in manufacturing and agriculture. You see the energy states, or some states that have both an energy and agriculture perspective, and that would be actually one state, North Dakota. Then you have the handful of energy states down in the uh, southwest, and then the manufacturing factor playing into the Midwest and parts of the East and uh, Oregon. So when you look at regional overall growth, it's going to be it's kind of a mixed bag. You're going to see some states, particularly the energy sector, is going to be showing lower growth than the national average. Many states will be at a national average, but will be pulled down a little bit, like Illinois, because of that agriculture and manufacturing exposure. And then you'll have stronger growth in places like the West and the Southeast. So let's look at resident, non-residential. Our industry saw a 66% decline in cement consumption in the non-residential market. We've recovered about 32% of that lost volume. Uh, the composition is changed in 2015. This shows you what, where we've lost cement consumption is in public utility and commodities. So essentially the oil and the agriculture piece affecting cement consumption. A lot of the oil drilling, there's a lot of cement used in oil drilling, so that's going to lag on overall cement consumption in the U.S. And then that pie shows you um, just the mix in the non-res market. <coughs> Office, hotel, motel are two examples of market segments where we're faced with competitive pressures going forward from alternative materials. The low rise market, average concrete share has been at about 28%. The long term shift, we see the long term demographic shift away from low rise and more into mid and high rise overall in the nation as the nation continues to move, become more and more urbanized. We're seeing pressures that are going to continue to drive overall concrete share there. Mid rise market, we have an average share of about 44%. It's been traditionally a very strong market for concrete, but we're probably at greatest risk in this marketplace because of some recent trends. In the high-rise market, we've been at 62%. There may be some threat there. Super tall structures, we've already seen that. That's really slowed down. Um, so then concrete framing shares for all buildings, and now we're seeing uh, a slow recovery overall. Where we see at-risk markets, low-rise hotels, low-rise office, primarily because of the wood industry's uh, cross-laminated timber. They're, they're looking to try to code approval to start doing wood frame construction with 10 and 12 stories. Mm -hmm. That will be a big threat to the concrete industry. The industrial manufacturing side, you know, you drive down an interstate, you see a lot of precast concrete warehouses. Well, more and more you'll see steel, steel, uh, uh, prefabricated steel structures. The public buildings market, which has always been strong for concrete, because of the, the pressures in the public sector, you're seeing uh, a move towards lesser and lesser uh, costly materials. So now the public outlook, we lost about 32%. The public side wasn't quite as, as rocky overall as private and residential. We've recovered about 30% of that lost volume. Federal highway spending has been an ongoing issue. Fast bill. It's Fix America's Surface Transportation is what FAST stands for. It had provisions in the first year to actually increase highway spending. So when you look at that curve, you see that turn up in overall construction spending on highways. But then in the four out years, spending reduced to less than the anticipated inflation rate, which will result in a continued reduction in overall highway spending. Oil price impacts uh, paving, obviously. The assumption was always that if oil prices drop below 75 bucks a barrel, you would see 
a corresponding downturn in asphalt prices, which would affect the competitiveness of concrete road systems to asphalt road systems. What our department has seen is because of changes in refinery techniques and capacity in the U.S., even though oil prices have fallen off the cliff, asphalt prices are not dropping. What you're seeing is the price of asphalt versus what was predicted to happen with the downturn or what historically should have happened hasn't happened. Asphalt has, has trended down somewhat, but it's stayed relatively flat while oil prices have declined dramatically. The reason for that is since 2006, uh, there's been a reduction in the production of asphalt and road oil by 39%. So there's less capacity and less material out there. It's because the refinery techniques have changed. Simple refinery techniques, there would be roughly about 39% of a typical barrel of oil as asphalt byproduct. Now they're doing a better job of making use of, of the full barrel, which means far less asphalt in the marketplace. We anticipate the asphalt prices are going to stay, at best, relatively stable. So uh, overall, concrete is now cheaper to build with for roads, which is relatively new historically. So over time, you'll see more and more concrete road construction once the overall paving industry works through some of the fundamentals that have been in place for a long time that tend to favor asphalt because it was always cheaper for many, many years. But you'll see that trending over time. Now let's look at residential. From a home sales composition, distressed properties, foreclosures, short sales were really impacting the single family market and uh, affecting overall price <coughs> and movement in sales in that market. That has turned down pretty dramatically. So you see before, before the crash, you see how it rate went way up. It's now falling back to less than 15% and it continues to decline. That's really favorable. That's a good thing. The states that have lagged, I believe Illinois is one, where there's a judicial component to foreclosure, short set, or foreclosures anyway. And that tends to slow down that process more so than in other states where they can move through those foreclosures very quickly. So that continues to lag in some states. The focus now on sales activity is going to be based more on fundamentals. Basically, supply and demand and affordability factors. Mortgage rates continue to be very favorable. Home prices will rise faster than inflation. We've, we've been seeing that trend. That will continue. And affordability continues to remain strong. Residential cement perspective, we, we're seeing now that the single family market has come down to about a five month share, which our, our chief economist has always indicated is the key indicator. And builders will, will start building um, consistently when, it, when it's at or below that level. And that's, that's where it's been, and that's where they anticipate it's going to stay. Constraints in the marketplace, primarily labor shortages and the availability of adequate property. The assumption being made by our economists is that the market will work through those processes and that's not going to be, that's a temporary problem that will not unduly constrain the market. While single family will, will come back, the multifamily market has been strong and will remain strong. And so it'll, it'll gather somewhat of a larger percentage of overall starts than it historically has in the past. Housing starts are predicted to continue to rise. Prior to the downturn, we had about 1.1 million homes, more than we needed for the, the demographics at that time. With the downturn, at about 2013, we were we had we were 4.2 million homes underbuilt. We're now at 7.4 million underbuilt. So the pent-up demand is huge.
The fundamental that isn't reflected here that's also playing in is the changes in qualifying for mortgages. Probably the biggest single factor that has slowed some of the projections that were out there. Multifamily shares, the long-term average is at about 26%. It's recently gotten as high as 41% of overall housing starts. So we're doing a lot more multifamily. And it goes back to the fact that a lot of people can't qualify for mortgages, they're renting, or they're buying smaller. And, and the trend is for that to continue. The millennials are less inclined to buy new, new single family, and the baby boom generation is tending to move more into the multifamily market as well. So that demographic is having an impact on this mix between single family and multifamily. Oh, I should mention the anticipated long-term trend that our economists are predicting is that this mix will stabilize at about 35%. So that's a significant change from that 26% in the old days. So multifamily is 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 going to gain or it's gained a larger share. It's going to continue at that level. So here, speaking more to those, that demographic shift, a uh, place like Illinois, single-family units typically have accounted for about 74% of total residential starts, but obviously the multifamily gains are going to affect that. The demographic trends will change, just as I mentioned. And the other thing I wanted to mention is the between the millennial preferences, the buying habits of um, and, uh, the uh, baby boomers changing, and also this trend we're seeing, like the millennials are moving back into the cities. Suggestion that there's going to be more urban growth than suburban growth. Yeah, I just want to reflect um, here. 2015, 2016, what our economists are predicting overall about 1.5 million housing starts overall. That's single family and multifamily combined. That's somewhat below the consensus. So Ed Sullivan continues to be a little bit more conservative than the, the overall consensus because of, of those underlying factors that I, that I mentioned. So, with that, I'll, I'll be glad to answer any questions. So above five stories, we've always thought you would go away from wood typically, and you're saying in the future that's not? No, what we're seeing is since the downturn, we saw the multifamily market get stronger. And the multifamily that would started to be built was using concrete as a pedestal for, say, one story, or sometimes a below grade parking level, one story of, let's say, retail, done with our materials and then five stories of wood. Because under code, they can go up to five stories. That gives them six overall. So the developers are using concrete as a pedestal to be able to build higher. And that's why our share of market has declined dramatically. Has the cement industry adjusted to all the EPA regulations that have been heaped upon them recently? Yes. Uh, in fact, they've worked very closely with EPA. There was some contentiousness for a time when the initial EPA requirements came out. At, at the same time, our industry was hit with such a downturn. <coughs> the doubling down of the EPA regs were just killer. PCA filed lawsuits along with other organizations, and everything I've seen is our industry as a whole satisfied. It, it's workable for our industry going forward. So everybody is in comp, uh, compliance now? Yeah, that's my understanding. Part, yeah. Yeah. There's some time elements involved in terms of uh, gaining compliance. So there were older yeah. uh, cement kilns and older processes that were, were just fundamentally inefficient and were dirtier. Yeah. And those needed to go away anyway. And so between the regs and the overall economic downturn, a lot of that capacity is gone. Prior to the downturn, there were a lot of plans for uh, capacity expansion. There's currently about 100 million metric ton capacity in the United States. We're operating now at about 85 million metric tons a year. So there's, there's space there right now. 
prior to the downturn, we were we were up against the full capacity. So um, our industry isn't faced with a capacity constraint for, for quite some time. Thank you for coming. Hey, not a problem. Please have lunch with us. Yeah, Don, please stay and have lunch. And, uh, but I really appreciate you coming back here. And I'm glad the news is better this time. Well, it is. Because <laughs> <laughs> last time I wasn't invited to stay for a while. <laughs> <laughs>